pretty much brought my entire van up onto the roof. Um, we've got a compressor, all the other stuff. I'm sure there'll be a few other things we need. Um, I do like to try to be as efficient as possible and take care of my stuff. I am that person that doesn't like my rope to be on the ground. So you see how I kind of roll it up. And then I always try to leave a little bit down there so that way we can still rope things up and down out of the customer's way. That way nobody's walking into it. But yeah, I try to think smart. We try to make our job a little bit easier. We've got the whole entire AC opened up. This is the grounded compressor right here. We're gonna use filter dryers to protect my S-Man manifold because I don't want to damage the internals and also to protect my recovery machine. Um, I don't think this is a nasty burn, but we're still gonna put filter dryers on there just to protect it. All right, we're putting core removal tools on there to speed up the process. Um, we're gonna do this one right now. So sometimes these things grab, majority of the times they don't, so push it in there. I'm pushing pressure on it as I'm spinning it. You can feel it when it releases. It's kind of bouncing. Yeah, I don't know if it's gonna grab it or not. Oops. Oh, it grabbed it. Ooh, but look at that, it's dirty. Yeah, it's nasty. So, okay, well, we got it on there. That's why we're gonna use dryers to protect because um, this, this one didn't come out and I had to blow it out and it came out black. So there's lots of carbon nastiness in there from the burnout. All right, we are just about ready. We still need to purge. Um, we're gonna purge real quick and then we'll zero out our scales. Uh, we're using the field piece wireless scale. The cool thing is, is it connects with the manifold and the handle for redundancy in case, you know, forbid one of them was to be messed up or something or lose connection, you could still do both or you can choose to do one, you know, it's kind of cool. So um, we're all connected. We used two uh, catch-all filter dryers to speed up the process and to protect my manifold and everything else. Normally people will put it just on the recovery machine, but in this situation we have one for each. That way we're not bringing both low and high through one filter. We've got one filter for each because I have a feeling that filter is gonna get plugged up with this uh, burn that we have, okay? Because it's real, um, you know, dirty inside there. So we're gonna go ahead and open this guy up. Looks like we've got a leak right here. So open this guy up, okay? So that's going into my manifold, right? So we're zeroed out there. Now we're gonna come right here. We're gonna loosen this guy up. Right, this is still closed. And we're gonna go ahead and open up the recovery machine to recover. And then now it's gonna purge right there. So when I open this right here, well actually let's open these two. Okay, and then open this, it's gonna start purging the air out. Looks like it's not quite purging what I want it to. There it goes. So now it's purging the air out. Not that we're gonna reuse this refrigerant anyways, but we're gonna to try to keep air out of this system. Okay, so that's good. Get it nice and tight. Make sure everything's nice and tight. We're gonna go ahead and uh, zero out our handle and zero out our manifold. That way we know that we're not gonna overfill the cylinder because we're gonna be watching the entire time. Now, I will tell you that this cylinder uh, is not gonna be overfilled by what's in the system, but we still wanna be careful and always monitor the, the weight so that way you don't overfill because if you overfill the tanks, you can lead to some big issues. So at this point, we're gonna go ahead and open this guy up. We've got the tank sitting in ice, that way we can speed up the process. Um, and we'll go ahead and turn on our machine now. So super easy on the field piece, uh, MR45, gives you the pressures and it has the soft start. So it slowly ramps up. So there we go, we're gonna let this guy run. And then uh, once it's done recovering, we'll start opening the system up and getting the compressor replaced. As we're recovering, this unit takes about 11 pounds of gas. I'm noticing that we've only done eight pounds of gas and we still are just about done, right? Um, so what I did was I shut off the flow right here so I still have this open. The machine shuts itself off because it has an auto stop. It pulled down to negative 19, then automatically turned off. If you hit start stop one more time, it'll pull down even lower and then automatically turn off too. But um, that's just to get everything out. Now, um, 
what I'm going to do, we've got nitrogen here, so we're going to go ahead and pressurize the system with nitrogen with that remaining vapor in there to use as a tracer gas so that we can do a quick leak search. We'll see if this unit's actually low on gas, like as it has a leak, or if maybe someone let refrigerant out not knowing what they were doing. Um, so uh, this guy shut off again, so we're good to go. What we're going to do is turn it over to purge and then hit start, and it's going to do everything it can to clear the refrigerant out of the machine and out of the hoses as much as possible. So it's just pumping it into that tank. Um, and then we're gonna pressurize this guy with nitrogen and do a quick leak search on it. Uh, we are pressurizing with nitrogen now. I pulled the filter dryers off so I didn't back push any of the stuff we pulled out of the system back into it, right? Um, and we're just putting nitrogen in uh, on both sides. We're gonna get it to about probably 150 PSI. And then we're going to do a leak search on this guy and see what we can figure out. All right, um, notice I wanted to point something out. When I was doing my recovery, I took off the quarter inch process hose and I went with a 3 8 process hose that has quarter inch ends on it. And that will speed up the recovery. And then I also, so I went with a 3 8 hose from here to the machine and then a 3 8 hose from the machine to the tank. And then you have two individual quarter inch hoses. Now, it'd go even faster if I put, if I had more 3 8 hoses, but I don't, so. All right, we've got field pieces uh, DR82 leak detector right here, okay? This is an infrared leak detector. Um, digital display on it is awesome. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and put it in turbo mode because I want the max sensitivity. You gotta be careful though in turbo mode because it can uh, really pick up some nuisance stuff. So if you're getting nuisance, then switch it down to a lower setting. But we're gonna do a quick leak search on this guy. We're gonna start right at this compressor because it seems that there might be a little bit of oil in that fuseite plug. So we're gonna put this guy right here. And the cool thing about the field piece leak detector is it has a lighted tip. So you can either look at the display right here or you can look at the tip. You can see that the display says refrigerant leak right there and it's showing a level. And then the lighted tip is also showing a leak. So it's leaking at the fusite little connection right there. So you gotta be very careful when you're um, when you're uh, pulling these plugs off because they can blow out. Uh, and in this situation, the, the direction or the short, I bet you happened right at the Fusite terminal. Um, maybe we can autopsy this compressor when we're done. But uh, I'm pretty confident that's gonna be our leak. We're gonna do a quick leak search on the rest of the system, but we definitely are leaking right in here. Maybe we'll get some uh, soap bubbles, some big blue on there. We're gonna spray this guy down. Now we do have power turned off. We're using, uh, Big blue leak detector. This stuff is awesome. Sprayed on, oops, see, that's what you don't want. You don't want bubbles, okay? Because that will give you a false reading. Give it a couple squirts, get a steady stream, and then spray it on there. Nice and good. All right, I'm being very careful not to position my face in front of the fusite terminals, okay? Because they can blow out at any given moment. I'm thinking that uh, from the looks of it, it's on this terminal and I'm gonna get the camera in there, but I gotta be careful not to get my face in there because we don't want it to pop. Now there is very small bubbles. I gotta see if I can get the camera to show them. And it's gonna be hard to pick up on camera, but I can actually see them coming out. And you can see a train of them coming down right around the bottom of this right here. And they're sliding down. So you gotta be very careful they're there so it's a very very small leak but it would totally make sense as to why there was oil right there so it's a small one though so you got to always pay attention you know and you know like I'm doing a repair on this we quoted this as just a compressor replacement but we have a little wiggle room in our quote but we really didn't picture or plan to do a leak repair so we're not finding anything else as of yet we're running the field piece leak detector so this is the third stage, so it's the bottom of this side and this side. It's this dryer right here. Look at this one. The sight glass doesn't mean anything. This just means someone probably only had this sight glass. Uh, it's a CSG sight glass dryer combo. That's probably all they had the last time someone did a repair on this. Um, but this is absolutely not needed. Looks like we got some uh, crazy brazing skills, but it's not leaking, so it is what it is. Um, but this is the dryer we're going to be replacing. So. We're gonna get started on this guy. We're gonna sand up the compressor. It's gonna be a direct swap. Um, this one right here is the new replacement compressor. And yeah, we just got a lot of stuff going on. All right, we're gonna light this guy. Put my rosebud tip on. 
and we've got nitrogen flowing through. We're gonna go ahead and unsweat these terminals real quick. Shouldn't take much. attention because there's smoke coming out because of the nitrogen and the heat you want to make sure that's not going into the unit because with the unit not on they use this for the air balance for the makeup air the building's going to be kind of negative so it could be filling the building up with smoke so you always want to pay attention to that Sometimes it'll touch and then it'll weld itself back. Looking good. Okay, we're good on that. Now we're gonna go get the TXV cut out, start prepping this compressor for replacement. Now we don't know what caused this compressor to go bad. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things. We're gonna go ahead and uh, um, change the uh, TXV out of precaution. And then uh, we'll change the contact or put a new dryer, start it up and have to troubleshoot further to see what happens. Um, I'm disconnecting the pressure control at the moment. So back in here are some plugs for the pressure control. If I undo those, boom, then the pressure control is loose. Actually, I don't even know if I need to disconnect the pressure control to be honest with you. No, I actually don't. I'll just leave it like that. That way I can move it around. We'll get the the compressor in and then figure everything else out after that. We do need to get this crankcase heater off down here though. I'm cutting this because we're gonna end up putting a suction line filter dryer right there. So it's also gonna aid in getting the compressor out and make the whole job easier. So this guy's a little heavy, kind of tricky, but we'll get it. forgot that before we go any further I want to cut the dryer out of the system and we're gonna purge the entire system with nitrogen with the TXV out the compressor out and the dryer out to try to get any nastiness out of the system so I don't use acid neutralizers or flush or anything like that I'm just gonna use dry nitrogen to purge the system and then we're gonna put two really good HH core dryers from Sporlin Now with the HH core dryers from Sporlin, they have a high wax removal. The theory is, is that um, with the acid, uh, well, if there's a burnout, the theory is that the, the, the oil and the, the refrigerant becomes acidic and potentially, depending on the damage in the compressor, it can start eating away at the, the wax or the plastic uh, on the windings of the compressor. And so the HH dryer is gonna be there to capture any of that stuff and it has a high wax removal. So we're gonna be going in with an oversized spore limb 16 cubic inch dryer to replace that little guy. All right, got nitrogen tank hooked up and I have this fitting from a, um, a little portable tank setup that I have, but it has a perfect little guy right here to blow the system out and a little valve. So we're just gonna go through and blast the system, putting a towel on the other end to see if we catch anything that comes out. So I put a, a white towel there so I can see if I capture anything. Okay, go ahead and give it a couple bursts. Keep going. Let it out. Stop. 
Keep going, just boom, 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 boom. Now what I'm doing here is I'm building up pressure and just going off and on, off and on, off and on to kind of build up back pressure so it scrubs the walls. Nothing's coming out. Okay, we're good on that. Now I want you to do the liquid line going back. Okay, so liquid line should be coming out of here. Okay, go ahead, keep going. Just on off, on off. Leave it on. Okay, we're good. Okay, nothing's really coming out. Um, we're gonna push through the condenser real quick. Get on the discharge line. And we're gonna push through the condenser now from the discharge line. Barely, and just leave it on. Nothing, let me see that side. Here you go. Anything coming out? Black. Yeah, nothing bad. Well, I think we're good. We're not getting a bunch of nasty oil or anything like that out. So we're gonna go ahead and proceed with putting the compressor back in the system now. Um, but it's important that we purge the system like that to try to prevent anything from clogging up the filter dryer unnecessarily, right? Uh, this doesn't seem like a really, really bad burnout. So I think we're gonna be okay. Notice that I took the screwdriver and put it up in here for lifting. It helps give you better leverage lifting the compressor. Okay, we'll get that guy bolted in and then we'll start fitting all the pipes in there and getting everything connected back in. Okay, so we're purging with nitrogen right now and we're gonna use the rosebud for the big joints and then we'll switch to the zero for the small joints. We are uh, done brazing, everything's in. Uh, we're gonna do a pressure test on the system. So we're gonna go ahead and go to the manifold right here. You hit tightness test, it takes you to this screen right here. Go ahead and turn on the pressure. We're gonna build it up. Uh, I don't have Schrader's or anything in here just cause we're just doing a tightness test and we're gonna release it and doing a proper evacuation and stuff. So we'll, uh, we'll get all that stuff done here in a minute. So we're gonna let it build up to about 150 PSI is where I'm gonna stop and then uh, this will start a timer and then we can watch it, uh, how much it changes if it does at all. All right, we got it to about 150 PSI, 151. Now, 
you want to let it sit for about five minutes let the system stabilize out okay and then hit start because you are going to see it deviate as the system's kind of stabilizing because you've got the sun hitting the condenser it's shady in the evaporator so you want to just let it sit and uh, equalize out and we're not holding our pressure test and I actually have a leak right here it's like I missed a spot this is why we do a pressure test so that way we can see if there's anything going on there there's like one spot where it didn't take probably because there was oil on this line so it's probably a little difficult but yeah it's right I can see it it's probably hard for you guys to see it but it's right there there's a tiny pinhole so we're gonna let the nitrogen out we're gonna braise that up real quick and then do another pressure test all right got to put back on or sweat just heated it up seems fine we're doing another pressure test to see if it holds all right it's stabilized out and I hit enter to start it and it starts the timer so it's been running for one minute so far we have no pressure change now we're gonna let it keep running but it's important too that we keep the high and the low side open and the process port closed that way if there's a pressure change on the low side or the high side we'll see it reflected on both right and this system doesn't have solenoid valves, but if it had solenoid valves, that's where that would really come in handy. But yeah, we're just gonna let it keep running. We're just kind of getting the vacuum rig set up for evacuation once we hopefully pass the pressure test. I'm very satisfied with this. We've been running five minutes and 40 seconds. We've changed 0.1 PSI. We've dropped. Uh, I'm not concerned about that at all. So we're gonna go ahead and get the vacuum rig set up, the micron gauge set up, and uh, Get vacuuming on this guy all right we're gonna start with the uh, gas ballast open right turn it on and you can tell the gas ballast is open because it flashes inside here with the light so we're gonna go ahead and run it with the gas ballast open until we get to about I don't know 2,500 microns on the micron gauge and then we'll shut the gas ballast same thing as the recovery machine this thing has a slow ramp up um, so you're able to start it on you know you don't have to have a specific size extension cord or anything like that and this is the vpx7 so this is the 10 cfm vacuum pump right now so we're going to let it run for a bit let the microns drop on the micron gauge and we uh, are using the mg44 field piece micron gauge so once we see that big get below i'd say 1500 we'll go ahead and close the gas ballast and then let the machine do all the work all right we just hit uh 1400 microns 1300 microns so just come on down here close off the gas ballast and uh, just let it run for a bit okay at this point my vacuum is kind of stalling out so we're going to do an oil change the cool thing about this pump is you have an on the fly oil change so just open this up grab your full clean oil right here close this guy pour the oil in There you go. On the fly oil change. Didn't lose our vacuum or anything. All is good. We'll dispose of this oil right here. And then we just fill this guy up for the next time and have it sitting right there. All right, um, I sent someone to go get a contactor. This contactor actually looks pretty bad inside. Pretty burnt up in there, but we'll open it up when we pull it out. So we're gonna change that out. We're still pulling the vacuum right now. It's about 546 microns. We're gonna let it keep running. Um, suction line filter dryer, HH core. So that's the high wax removal. It's made for burnouts basically. And we have an HH core 16 cubic inch. So before they had a five cubic inch. So we're going massively oversized. We'll get something to screw that guy in and secure it. We're gonna start putting the panels on and just kind of cleaning up our messes. We got all kinds of stuff up here, so. Definitely got to clean up. We're just trying to make best use of our time. So we're still running in a vacuum. Um, I'm uh, what I ended up doing was because I got two hose set up here. I ended up valving this one off. So you see this one's closed, and the micron level did rise. Now the reason why it was lower was because this was getting pull from the hose versus being in the system. But now that I closed this off, this is the furthest point in the system so the micron gauge is now getting a true reading and it's only pulling from the discharge line you see so this is actually the best way to do it i do an initial pull with two hoses then i valve one off and then finish the vacuum with just one hose so we're currently at 574 microns i, I have it isolated and the other compressors are on that way the customer can get some cooling in there i went ahead and uh secured the liquid line filter dryer put the panel on 
and we're just, you know, waiting for the vacuum. I'm probably gonna take a lunch right now while this is all happening. I'm uh, just getting back from lunch, and uh, the cool thing is I can pull it up on the job link app. <clears throat> the entire time I was eating my lunch out in my van, I was watching the evacuation. Uh, all together, I was, uh, I'd say, 65, 70 feet away from the AC unit, and I had full connection the entire time. So from the looks of it, our evacuation is looking to be good. So we're going to go over there and uh, do our um, uh, decay test now. All right, we're going to go ahead and valve it off. We valved off right here. So now we're just going to do our decay test. So we pulled down well below 500. Um, I say we give it about 10 minutes and we don't want to see it go above 1,000 microns is where I'd be happy with. But I think we're going to be okay. You can also do a bar graph on the app. So you can just watch it as it's rising. Uh, we're also changing the contactor as we speak, getting that replaced. Um, we'll pull apart the other one and show you the insides of it because it was pretty bad. It's all about diving into things to try to figure out why they failed. Look at the points on that contact, or on those contacts, I should say. Um, I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if this is the cause of the grounded out compressor. Bad electrical connections lead to heat, lead to issues within the compressor, low voltage, voltage drop. Um, yeah, that's not good. So uh, let's see, this guy had uh, auto powered off, so let's turn this back on real quick. It's dropping, so it's taking a second, but yeah, we're still good. It's, it's slowly rising, but if it was a leak, I would expect to see it be a direct rise. Um, it's natural for it to continue to rise, but it should kind of stabilize out. You can see we're actually kind of dropping down right now, 791. So we're going to call this good on the vacuum. We're going to start taking that off, but you always got to dig into these things when, when you're changing compressors, especially when you have compressors that are shorted to ground. You got to figure out why, okay? And I think this contactor was the reason why. I think this could have been prevented. Had we done proper preventative maintenance, we could have been doing voltage drop tests across this contactor. Um, I can tell you too, the filters on this unit are plugged. I mean, it's, it's the things like this, you know, the lack of preventative maintenance. Now, at the same time, I get it. You know, restaurants are really struggling right now to find employees to make money. So it's a struggle to do PM service too, but you know, this is the kind of stuff that happens. This is an R22 compressor. We're putting R22 back in. This is expensive. Before, we're gonna use the manifold to charge, okay? But before we hook anything up, we're gonna go ahead and do an evacuation on the manifold, and then we'll open it up to the system. So I'm pulling on just the process hose, then we'll go ahead and open these guys up. Open this guy up. We're dropping down. You can see it's dropping in microns because there is a micron gauge in here. Um, it's not best practice to pull through the manifold, but sometimes you have to in certain situations. In this one, I had plenty of room and I was able to use the, the separate hoses to be able to pull through it. So we're uh, ready to open to the system right now. Okay. Slowly rising a little bit. That's okay because I think our system was at like 900 or something like that. Um, we're just gonna let it pull down to get to where the system level is and then we're gonna get ready to charge this guy. We are gonna add refrigerant now. So I've got the job link app in the background and that black bar is just from my phone. It's weird. Um, and uh, it reads the same thing. So we're gonna zero this out and then zero this out. Okay, we're zeroed out. We're gonna open up the process hose, which is already open. We're gonna purge to right here. Okay, we're good. And we're gonna go open the high side and charge to the high side. We're gonna charge to 11 pounds, I think it's eight ounces, I think. We're gonna check right now. But you can see we're adding refrigerant. So we're doing good so far, so we're just gonna give it some time. All right, we've got about five pounds of gas in there. Um, you always wanna wait until you're in positive pressure to take off the micron gauge. So that way uh, you don't introduce any oxygen or any outside air or moisture into the system. So micron gauge is off. Uh, we're just about done to the point that we're gonna have to turn it on and charge the rest. And I don't think we're gonna have enough in this cylinder, so we're gonna have to go grab another cylinder. Okay, it is uh, about that time. Um, I also sent a technician to get a new molded plug because it doesn't look the greatest on the inside and I'll show it to you guys, but I think we're gonna be able to start it up for now. So everything's ready, everything's closed. We'll have to charge the rest of the refrigerant to the 11 pounds, eight ounces once we get it going. 
power's on, we're gonna have to put it into test mode to finish charging. So to put it into test mode, we're gonna hit shift, unit test, and it's gonna change from a decimal to C01. We're gonna change it to C11. Hold it down when the decimal appears, it'll turn on. And then we gotta charge. Add refrigerant so it doesn't go off on low pressure. And we're just gonna add to the 11 pounds, eight ounces. I don't think I'm gonna have enough in this cylinder, so we're probably gonna have to use my other cylinder. So we'll just add it until we get there. So far it's doing good. Cold suction line, but that's also because we're adding refrigerant right here. Discharge line's hot. might just make it. Wow, it's gonna be really close. It's just running out. We're at 10 pounds, 15 ounces. Literally gonna have to add a couple ounces maybe from the other cylinder, that's kind of funny. All right, at this point, what we're gonna do is we're gonna hit hold, okay? We're gonna hold that weight. And the field piece app is gonna allow me to put the new cylinder on there, keeping that weight so I don't have to try to do the zeroing out with the new cylinder or do the math. I have the new thing on there. Now, it only works within the field piece app. So you see this now says negative nine, whatever, okay? So we want to purge, okay, we're purged. It's all the way up to there. And then we hit continue. And I want to continue. Boom. So now we keep adding gas. I really dig that about the field piece app. And we never lost our weight. Oh, I guess I gotta open this guy. There we go. Look at that, that is awesome. I really like that about their app. So now we just add it to the eight ounces, 11 pounds, eight ounces. And we're good. This guy's fully charged. We're gonna let it operate now. I went ahead and switched over to my probes for ease of use and uh, we've got a 20 degree temperature split across the condenser. About 180,000 BTUs, delivered capacity. R22, superheat's a little bit on the low side. Compressor superheat's about 17 degrees. I'd like to see that a little bit higher, but we'll give it some time. Subcooling's about 11 degrees. Um, everything's looking good. I'm not seeing any problems here. So we're running a 40 degree evaporator temperature, 104 degree, 105 degree saturation temperature for the condenser. This guy's looking good. So we're gonna go ahead and take the probes off. Um, we're gonna mark, we'll check the pressure drop and we'll mark it on the dryer for the next guy so that way we know what the pressure drop is across the dryer. And then we'll just keep an eye on it and we're still waiting for my guy to come back with this plug. We're gonna change this out too. But yeah, so far everything's looking great. I already got a pressure probe on the top of the suction filter dryer and one on the bottom right here. It looks like we're just gonna call it one PSI pressure drop, 69.1 and 70.7. So we're gonna call it a one PSI pressure drop and then we'll just monitor it the next time we come out. My chicken scratch, I can't write worth anything, but one PSI drop, that's close enough for my, for me, I'll be able to understand it. <laughs> Nobody else will. But I mean, it's close, it's, it's marginal. But yeah, we're looking good, man. All right, we shut it off to do the little Molex connector. We got a new one on there. We're just wiring it in right now to the contactor. And I'm gonna go ahead and leak check my braze joints real quick. I don't anticipate any problems because we passed a pressure test and an evacuation test. But just to be safe, we'll go over them. Not seeing any issues. Again, using the DR82. And you know what, I need to change the sensitivity over to turbo because that's the most sensitive. But again, you just need to be careful because it'll pick up leaks you don't want to find sometimes. Nothing there. So um, I already checked the dryer, so we'll come over here. Oh yeah, and I couldn't deal with it. I, I changed the filters too. Look at these things. They were plugged. I, I was just, there's no way. They're just gonna end up ruining another compressor. So we went ahead and uh, threw some new filters in the unit. The filters weren't part of my quote, but I'll just make sure they understand <laughs> it's gonna have to be done because they just lose another compressor all right yeah I'm not seeing any problems here so we're all connected everything's good all right we are back today we're just gonna do a test on this system it's been running um, we're doing a pressure drop test again across the dryer the suction line filter dryer 
70.6 and 71. So it looks like it's still one PSI drop, which is what it was the other day. And then I also have temperature clamps across the liquid line filter dryer. So let's just call it 90 and 91. So we have about a one degree temperature drop across the filter dryer right here. So that's good. So we just wanted to see if we were plugging up the dryers. Um, this is all broken down now. This is uh, is rusting really fast. So we've got to kind of keep that in mind. But we do have some pretty good copper plating going on right down in here, right in here. Again, it's kind of hard to tell with the rust. Um, the uh, scroll plates definitely had some uh, flooded starts because you can see by the little tooling marks that I've been informed. My buddy Trevor Matthews is the one that told me about that. Um, so we know we've had flooded start issues. This was a grounded compressor. You can clearly see the motor windings are destroyed. Okay, this whole thing was black. Uh, there was plenty of oil in the compressor. That's all the oil that I pulled out of it. So there was more than enough oil in there. So that's not the problem. The floating seal definitely has been overheating. This whole thing has been overheating. And I'm gonna, two things. Number one, this is broken. I don't know the exact name of this. It goes right below the scroll assembly. There was a piece of it down in the windings. And if you look at this closely, it kind of looks like it's been shorting out. And it's definitely got caught in there. But that to me looks like it was shorting out because it looks like it's melted, like it's molten that's re-affixed itself. And that was down in the bottom of the compressor. This was all still back up in the top. Um, this piece, I can't remember if this one was down in the bottom too. I think it was. I think this one was down in the bottom. Um, but I will tell you this customer is not good at doing preventative maintenance. Uh, they run dirty condensers all the time. So overheating issues for sure. Flooded start issues. It did have a crankcase heater, so I don't know why. And the crankcase heater was working. Um, but yeah, this is definitely a catastrophic failure to say the least. I mean, look at those windings. They're just disintegrated. But I don't see any issues with the bearings. Um, everything looks fine up in here, you know some copper plating going on down in here it's kind of hard to see but there is a little bit in there oh yeah it's nice and oily still a little bit that's well, interesting I mean an interesting breakdown but it wasn't a lack of oil um, I thought it was just gonna be because it was it didn't seem like a very nasty burn at least it didn't get throughout the system but it definitely I mean that oil is pure pure black and it's kind of thick too it's nasty so yeah this guy's toast for sure but it's always cool to cut these things open to kind of figure out you know what happened um, the idea of seeing copper plating happening makes you know that you had moisture and acids in the system slowly breaking the system down it's also interesting too um, I believe this is like an oil slinger or something right here and uh, it is disintegrated so that's intriguing. And I don't know if it's because of the cleaner. I don't think it's because of the cleaner that I used. Um, I'll have to look at my video footage and see if it was disintegrated before I dunked it in the cleaner. But yeah, it's just like flaking off. It's really interesting. Um, but yeah, we definitely had an acid situation in this one. So, uh, you know, we'll have to go back and uh, check pressure drops across the filters and do an acid test if the customer allows us to do it. But that's it for this one. Compressor changeouts are long, tedious jobs, and if you don't follow all the proper uh, recommended practices, if you don't do everything in order, it leads to it just taking even longer and or not being done correctly, okay? Um, you always want to take your time. You always want to protect your tools. Uh, like when I started to recover the gas, I knew it was burnt. I usually, I don't always put filter dryers when I'm recovering gas as long as I know it's good, right? But especially on the systems that are bad, I'm going to put dryers to protect my equipment, okay? Having the right tools on these jobs is what makes them go smoother, right? And the field piece products that I was using in here are worth protecting, especially the recovery machine um, when I'm recovering that nasty refrigerant. So put two spoiling catch-alls, one on the liquid, one on the suction, or one on the discharge, one on the suction, and that way I get full flow through the system. I'm not 
um, taking any, you know, I'm not slowing it down, making restrictions by using the filter dryers, right? Because I put one on each side instead of just putting one where both the quarter uh, inch lines from the high and the low side go into one dryer, I put one on each line, right? And again, it's just about making everything go smoother, using large diameter hoses, letting the recovery machine, the MR45, do what it's supposed to do at its full flow rates, okay? Anytime you can use larger diameter hoses with your equipment when you're doing recoveries or even evacuations, it's going to um, put less wear and tear on your equipment and it's going to make the process go a lot faster, okay? Same thing with uh, reducing the discharge pressure on the recovery machine by immersing the tank, the recovery tank in ice water, that we were keeping the condensing temperature down of the refrigerant, thus putting less wear and tear on the machine, okay? So having those tools and treating them right is so important because those tools, you know, if, if I go to do a job tomorrow and my recovery machine's not working, that's an inconvenience to me. If I can do anything to prevent that from happening, and then the same goes for my meters, my drills, all my different stuff, right? The more you take care of it, the better it's gonna take care of you in the long run, okay? And having the right tools for the job makes it go so much smoother, okay? But then also understand something. When we're working with all these fancy digital tools and digital recovery machines and digital gauges and smart probes, the job link probes, all these different things, it's so important to understand how they work and how to know when there's a problem because there's things that we can do when we are putting, let's say we're using the job link probes, right? Let's say you turn on the, or you, you put the job link probes on the system before you zero out the job link probes. Well, depending on whether or not the last place you used them was higher or lower elevation than where you're at now, there might be a pressure change in between the two. And so then the probes might not work the same because the probes are affected by atmospheric pressure. Okay, so as you move around, you know, you need to make sure you understand how your tools work. And so whenever you're using the job link probes or any smart probes for that matter, uh, digital gauges too, you want to make sure you turn them on and zero them out at atmospheric pressure before you apply them to the system. Because if, you know, they're reading three, four PSI off and I throw them on the system and I'm trying to charge a critically charged system, well, we could have some problems if we're you know, using uh, the, the the probes themselves or the manifold itself to give us accurate readings and it's not accurate, okay? So we have to know how to use our tools and how to interpolate the data and know when there's something wrong, okay? So, you know, we have to make sure that we're following all those steps. Um, this particular system, I was surprised the customer went with it, but then again, I kind of understood that they wanted to fix it because they can't get new units right now. It's taking forever, so they decided to go with it. And to, for all the comments, yes, I still use R22, okay? The customer is 100% okay with that. I'm not going to try to talk them out of using R22 if that's what they want, and I give them the options, and they fully understand that it could be potentially save them a little bit of money in the short term if they go to an alternative refrigerant but in the long term they may run into some issues because there's capacity loss um, there's considerations you have to think about when you're changing over to alternative refrigerants and different things like that so i give my customer the options and they choose to go with r22 refrigerant right so we're going to try to give them the best bang for their buck they spent a lot of money making this repair and i want to make sure that this system's going to last so i'm looking at everything i went back and did a pressure drop test across both the dryers, uh, check the temperature on the liquid line filter dryer, and then I'm going to try to talk my customer into letting me go back and doing an oil test, right, to be able to test for any acids in the system and possibly changing the dryers again. Um, it's so important that we try to keep up on these things. Now, I am not a fan of using additives, um, you know, uh, acid neutralizers and different things like that in the system because I just don't know what happens to those chemicals that you're putting in there right and if you ask the manufacturers not the oe or not the manufacturer of the neutralizer but if you ask the manufacturer of the copeland compressor if they recommend using an additive in their compressor to neutralize acids they're gonna say no okay they don't recommend that they recommend the only thing that goes in the system is what came in the system okay refrigerant and refrigerant oil the oil that belongs in there and that's pretty much all that's supposed to be in there so I personally don't use neutralizers or any of that stuff I don't use flush or anything okay I just go naturally with what we have in there and we uh, purge the system with nitrogen I went ahead and changed the TXV and the contactor and I kind of wanted to talk about that too 
Um, when you have a compressor failure, you need to try to figure out why it went bad. Now, obviously, when the compressor is bad, you have no way of knowing, right? There's not a whole lot you can do. You can inspect a few things like the contactor. In this case, I kind of had a plan on changing the contactor and I went back with the TXV also. We don't know what caused that compressor to go bad. It could have been a broken belt because I told you there was a slight discoloration on the whole body of the compressor like it had been flooding back. So I know that this customer doesn't do preventative maintenance, so it could have been uh, belts being broken or belts being loose and the system flooding back. That could have had something to do with it. Something broke that, that, that piece inside the compressor. What it was, I don't know, okay? Um, so we do our best. So in this situation, because it's, it's not a system I can pump down or anything, I changed the TXV out of precaution, was planning on changing the contactor, and good thing I did because it was trashed, right? And then as we were assembling it, we saw that the Molex plug for the Fusite connection had a lot of melting inside of it, and it wasn't making a good connection. So where the, the, the grounded compressor actually came from is hard to say because I think we had two things going on here. We had a bad contactor. We had an overheated compressor. Um, we had a, a poor Molex connector, um, but... You know, I don't know which one caused which or if it was just a combination of multiple things, okay? Something obviously broke the pieces on the inside of that compressor too. And I don't think that would have happened from the compressor grounding out. I think that that piece might have been what got, went down there. It's hard to say. You know, that piece might have touched the windings and rubbed for long enough that it shorted out. It's, it's hard to say exactly what happened. But I try my best. I give the customer the information right? And with the right tools, I'm able to give them accurate, valid information. Okay. So it's so important that we invest in ourselves and invest in good, high quality tools that work for us and that work for the jobs we're trying to do. Okay. I really, really appreciate you guys making it to the end of the video. As usual, if you guys haven't already, please consider checking out my website, hvacrvideos.com. Uh, please make sure you're subscribed to the channel. If you aren't already, make sure uh, please interact with the channel, leave a comment, leave some feedback, just anything to let YouTube know that you're watching the video, okay? Um, again, I really, really appreciate you guys, and uh, we will catch you on the next one, okay?